Welcome back, everyone. Now we move into our final panel of the day. The New Mexico SBIR and STTR Innovation Summit has always been held in collaboration with the Naval Sea Systems Command, you may also hear it referred to as NAVC, as a way to highlight some of their topics in the current pre-release BAA. Over time, we have added other service components to this information debrief and shifted the focus to talk about the different service components and how they approach the SBIR and STTR programs. I'd like to welcome to the stage Del Mackey, NMFAST Program Manager. Del will moderate this final panel on the DOD, SBIR, and STTR programs and end the event with some closing remarks. And as always, to the audience, we are trying to leave some time for Q&A. So just as a reminder, feel free to send in questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. Dale, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Garrett. And thank you very much for serving as our Master of Ceremonies today. Um, we greatly appreciate it. And it was an awesome job. Thanks. Have fun. So everyone, for this topics panel, Usually what we do is we'd like to gather some information that is going to be very vital for you when you're looking at the Department of Defense. You know, the Department of Defense is one of the largest funders under the SBIR and STTR programs. And typically the DOD uses these programs as a way to procure solutions for problems they're facing within specific domains or areas. They need novel products to address their issues, and they rely on small businesses like yourself to create these products. We're going to have a presentation now from several of the program managers actually within both NAVC and NAVAIR. So we're going to let them kind of take control here, take the stage, and tell you about their different program executive offices, our PEOs, how they operate, um, the kinds of problems they face, and some unique opportunities within their PEOs. We are going to actually start with Ryan. And Ryan, I am bringing your slides up right now. Uh, Ryan, while we're waiting for me to figure this out, do you wanna kind of real quickly introduce yourself to people? Yeah, of course. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Blondino. I am the technology manager for NAVC's headquarters and directorates. Today, uh, during this briefing, we'll be reviewing the HQ and directorates portfolio stakeholders, uh, several key FY22.1 topics, and the types of innovative capabilities that we typically look for. Um, it'll be interesting going through our portion of the brief, mostly because all the other technology managers from NAVC that you'll be hearing from today neatly align themselves to one of the PEOs or program executive offices uh, found at NAVC. Uh, however, HQ and directorates is a little bit different and we'll go through that in some of these slides, which I see that are up right now. Thank you, Dell. appreciate that. Can we go ahead and uh, go ahead and jump right into the next one then, please? So as I was saying just a moment ago, um, in terms of NAVC's layout, most of the other technology managers from NAVC who are speaking here today neatly align themselves to one of the PEOs that you see there in the top left-hand corner, including PEO ships, PEO USC, PEO subs, PEO IWS, and uh, even carriers. Um, but we're a little bit different from the HQ and directorates perspective. Instead, HQ and directorates focuses on the engineering, design, and delivery requirements for a wide variety of groups outside of the PEOs, including CO5's systems engineering, um, the CO4 shipyards, CO3 Cyber Engineering and Digital Transformation Directorate, as well as Diving and Salvage Operations, uh, all of which are more commonly located uh, near the center of the org chart that you see here. Uh, so just to briefly touch on some of those, CO5, the Naval Systems Engineering and Logistics Directorate, is responsible for providing the expertise and technical authority necessary to design, build, maintain, modernize, and even dispose of Navy ships, submarines, and associated warfare systems. Then under CO4 or the shipyards, um, the shipyards have the important mission of getting ships to sea and keeping them ready uh, as they're the preferred integrator of logistics, maintenance, and industrial operations. We also have CO3 or the Cyber Engineering and Digital Transformation Directorate who was stood up uh, about one to two years ago. So they're still relatively new, 
but their mission is to deliver enterprise digital capabilities um, as well as infrastructure for cybersecurity, digital work, and even more. Um, they have technical authority for the cybersecurity onboard ships, excluding networks and communications handled by NAVWAR. Uh, more specifically, they oversee cyber for hull, mechanical and electrical systems, as well as radar, sonar, combat systems, and more. Uh, we also uh, oversee uh, the projects for NOSA, uh, which was formerly a separate field activity of NAVC that now actually resides under O5, specifically under C-O5X. And they provide ordnance safety for the Naval Enterprise, ranging from their technical authority over explosive safety to technical policies, procedures, and even design criteria. Lastly, we have diving and salvage operations, which provides cradle to grave services for diving equipment, salvage, deep ocean search, and, and more. Uh, they cover basic research through prototype development, acquisition operations, and just general life cycle management. So in summation, we're a cross-cutting portfolio that reaches throughout the command and spans a large number of talented, technically varied organizations. Next slide, please. So this slide is a more in-depth review of our specific stakeholders. Here we provide a granular look at each of the organizations that I was speaking to before. Uh, we collaborate with 15 different offices across CO5, whose expertise ranges from additive manufacturing to ship integrity and performance engineering and, and more. Um, we also work with six offices across diving and salvage operations. We're directly plugged into four different shipyards under CO4, such as uh, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, Pearl Harbor, uh, as well as Portsmouth and even Puget Sound. We also collaborate with the three divisions of CO3's Cyber Engineering and Digital Transformation Directorate, such as the Cybersecurity Engineering Component and uh, the, let's see here, the Digital Readiness Services. So again, this is just that closer, more granular look at some of those individual branches um, and divisions found with each of these parts of our organization and groups that are interested in implementing phase three contracts and or providing insight and input along the way from phase one to phase two and ultimately phase three of SBIR and STTR efforts. Next slide, please. Okay, so now just briefly on to some of our FY22.1 topics. I know we are somewhat short on time, so we won't go through all of them, uh, but we'll just hit on some of the three most important ones to us right now, just to give everyone an idea of what we're looking for. First, we'll start off with the Shipboard Advanced Metal Manufacturing Machine, our topic N221-194. The overall objective of this topic really is to develop a Shipboard Advanced Metal Manufacturing System for Navy expeditionary environments with a closed loop feedback system adaptable to operational conditions. So existing metal additive manufacturing installations are typically found either in industrial shops or laboratories and are most often purchased as pre-developed commercial off-the-shelf products. Instead of modifying COTS products to meet requirements and Navy needs, this particular topic and system will ultimately be designed from the ground up to meet unique integration requirements that all expeditionary um, installed equipment must adhere to. Uh, things like ship motion, vibration, power, and a variety of others. Doing so will ultimately allow us to implement this shipboard advanced manufacturing capability um, in order to reduce some of our reliance on hard to source parts. It could help us reduce overall costs with acquisition, it could even allow us to field more effective additive manufacturing systems and reduce our reliance on vulnerable supply chains that everyone I'm sure has seen the impacts as a result of the uh, COVID-19 and its um, impacts across the entire country. Up next, we'll just briefly speak to the Design for Additive Manufacturing, or DFAM, risk tool set, which is topic number N221620. Uh, with this particular topic, we want to develop a tool set that will actually enable additive manufacturing design and manufacturing-driven risk analysis uh, within a single user interface. There are a variety of existing software packages uh, in existence right now for geometric optimization and modeling and simulation, but they're often disjointed, they come in different packages and don't share data between one another. Uh, the solution that's gonna be developed under this particular topic 
would not only include both of these, uh, but should also be able to incorporate a risk analysis of using additive manufacturing as compared to traditional manufacturing to inform the additive manufacturing technical authority on the expectation of part performance based on the manufacturing methodology ultimately used to uh, develop a particular part. Um, it's an excellent tool that will help guide NAVC in its acquisition of various components and uh, its implementation and or distribution across the fleet and whether we need to provide those uh, parts through traditional manufacturing methodologies or through additive manufacturing capabilities and or to augment um, those current processes and repairs um, when necessary. Overall, this tool will assess and reduce risk associated with adopting additive manufacturing parts to reduce lead times on some of those hard to source parts. It could also increase manufacturing uh, sources for us when performing those repairs and ultimately increase our readiness. So then lastly, we'll touch on our third um, topic that we're also really jazzed about, which is the modernized Navy fan coil assembly, our topic N221-629. So this topic is specifically aiming to develop and demonstrate durable, long life, modernized fan coil assemblies. A lot of the HVAC systems on ships today were actually developed decades ago with little change in as many as 60 years. So what this topic will do is work towards developing a new assembly that will be a step towards modernizing some of these legacy systems uh, by providing cooler, lighter, more compact drive systems that can react smoothly in response to temperature variations um, and ultimately improve our energy efficiency of systems aboard our vessels. Um, this would in turn allow us to address the growth of thermal loads in future ship designs and lower overall life cycle maintenance efforts. All right, next slide, please. And that pretty much brings us to our summary um, because I wanna be cognizant of time. But in short, despite the variability and some of the technologies being pursued, our portfolio is very much focused on maintainability and sustainability within the context of readiness. So our FY22.1 topics heavily support the national defense strategy's desire for distributed logistics and maintenance. Um, these strategic technologies will also enable the on-time delivery of ships and submarines, which is a key tenet of NAVC's campaign plan to expand the Advantage 3.0. Uh, our ability to deliver ships for new construction and out of maintenance availabilities is on time specifically is critical to meeting these fleet needs. Um, coordinating these technologies across PEOs, shipyards and engineering directorates uh, is essential if we want to ultimately transition these technologies to the fleet. So I strongly encourage everyone when reviewing the broad agency announcement under the Navy to ask questions to the available channels and reach out to the POCs that are identified with the topics you have an interest in while we're in this pre-release stage and can have open communications. This really allows you to ask the hard hitting questions and then, uh, very strong specifics that these technical experts can help answer for you. So that way you can put your best foot forward when providing a proposal for this uh, 22.1 slash dot A cycle under the SBI or STTR program. With all that said, thank you very much for your time, and I will hand it back to Dell and the rest of the other NAVC PEO technology managers to tell you about the other exciting topics we have taking place uh, in this cycle. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Brian. So next up, we have Paul Chandler. Paul, I am pulling up your slides right now, and hopefully it does not give me an error out of the gate like it did last time. There we go. Paul, it is now your show. Great. If you recall Mr. Blondino's first slide, he showed the NAVC org chart with the PEOs over on the left. They had a uh, dotted line connecting to NAVC and a hard line connecting to ASNRDA. So we have different chains of command between the uh, the uh, uh, the systems commands, NAVC, NAVAIR, and NETWARCOM and such, and the PEOs are, are uh, working hand in hand. We're on the org chart and we use all of the, uh, all of the services from NAVC, but we have uh, acquisition responsibilities. And uh, 
with uh, with PEO ships, we're team ships. So we also have a second flag officer that's uh, in service ships. And uh, on the uh, Brian's chart, it was down on the bottom right as a hard connect through Nav C. So we serve both Nav C and the uh, and the PEO. Next slide, please. So on the PEO side, on the acquisition side, we've had some uh, recent changes. They've stood up the DDGX program and merged that with the uh, electric ships office under PMS 460. Uh, PMS 500 will be uh, will be sending the the first Zumwalt ship, the DDG 1000 over to in-service ships come the first of the year. We've also had realignment with the, uh, with uh, aligning the resource sponsors, the program offices and the shipyards. So we've moved uh, the LPD 17 from PMS 317 and moved it into PMS 377 with the uh, with the LHA class, and they have a common shipyard and a common resource sponsor. And the uh, several of the craft from uh, the LCACs and such have moved over to uh, PMS 317. Next slide. So here we have the C-21 side, the nav C component of team ships and uh, PMS-443 on top will be taking the, uh, not only the in-service LCS, which is relatively new as of one October, but they, they will have responsibility for the, the uh, DDG-1000. Most of the rest is as you've known it from before, the in-service ship said. Next slide, please. So um, we have a few topics. I'm just gonna step through them real quick, high level. Uh, with our autonomy for the combatant craft, we're looking at in harbor, uh, meshed command and control of uh, of uh, protection assets and uh, and uh, the, the surveillance assets. So if you have a, a bad actor, you need to look at all of all of the uh, assets will be aware, but only those necessary will be detailed to intercept or or take. Uh, up to a combat action on, on the uh, intruders while the rest will disperse uh, to provide, still providing full coverage. On the uh, unmanned vehicle storage system, we just show a torpedo tube because it's just a tube, right? We stuff torpedoes in them, but we can put anything in there that we want to toss out into the water. But we're looking for uh, for uh, not specifically torpedo tube launchers for unmanned vehicles, but we're looking for a common system to handle the host of unmanned vehicles that are coming to us from across the board from all different programs. And they're not all, they don't all have a, uh, a shipboard interface system that comes with the package. Next slide, please. Over the Sora messenger line with the uh, next generation logistics ship that's on the horizon, uh, they need to bring fuel hoses to the beach. And it can be quite, quite a length of hose they'll have to pull. But the first thing you gotta get in is a uh, messenger line so you can tag it and start pulling a heavier line. So then you can pull the big fuel hoses over. And uh, we don't care if it's, uh, if it's a uh, little quadcopter or any other mechanism, just get our lines to shore and then manage manage the uh, 
as autonomously as possible the um, movement of the hose to the beach without tying up a lot of people. The well deck securing system for the LCUs. There have been incidents in the uh, North Sea, not real recently, but not, not long ago, where we've had uh, fully loaded landing craft in the well deck of a ship that uh, the timbers keep falling. And at some point when it starts getting too bad, you can't go reset the timbers. Next thing you know, you've got a, a craft that weighs the better part of a million pounds slapping back and forth in the well deck, and that's not good. So we're looking for a better way to do that. Um, next slide, please. Radar absorbing material, the uh, DDG-1000 is already having some uh, some high maintenance issues with the uh, RAM material, the radar absorbing material, and we're looking for uh, an easier solution that maybe even a sailor could do instead of uh, having to bring on a specialized uh, maintenance team to do the to do the work. Low hazard heat pump for distributed cooling. The uh, the chill water loop on the ship is really running colder than it really needs to be if you have uh, some point of use cooling. And we're not looking for standard refrigeration cycles with Freon. We know we want to use CO2 as the, uh, as the gas. And we can raise the chill water loop if we do this uh, system wide on the ship and uh, effectively return 50% of the uh, HVAC uh, load back to the, uh, to the HVAC plant so they can they can be servicing the new uh, high power needs that are coming with uh, the high power radars and rail guns and lasers, oh my, all of that stuff. And along with rail guns and lasers, we're using, we're going to uh, medium voltage, which is not medium voltage for the house. We're talking 12,000 volts at several megawatts of power. And uh, they really don't have IEEE requirements for the, uh, for the spacing of those cables, whether it's the air gap or the surface gap between the cables. And we need to establish the IEEE requirements and a methodology for, for validating that requirement. And I believe that's, do I have another slide? Uh, no, Paul, that is the end of I the I think that's it. All righty, great. Thank you very much, Paul. So now we are going to hear from Roberto. Roberto, I am bringing up your slides right now. So, uh, hey, my name is Roberto Sanchez, and I'm the technology manager for Team Submarine. Uh, last time I was here, Team Submarine had just got undergone a uh, reorganization. And the, um, the only visual aid that I could provide was a four block diagram that I did myself the night before. And uh, wasn't really wasn't really that detailed. So, um, and um, at the time, all, those, all the org charts that were available were for official use only and not usable, go figure. So in true government fashion, uh, this October came around and I still did not have a releasable org chart for that, uh, that organization, for that real. But that all became OBE with uh, a new and improved rework that happened this past October. So uh, to summarize that, Team Sub retained the original three flag officers that we had in the last reorg. However, those, those uh, flag officers uh, underneath the program executive offices uh, have just been realigned to provide uh, to provide better uh, support for the warfighter. So um, I'd like to uh, move on to the right side first, which is what I'll just, I'll just talk to it. So it's, uh, what you can't see there, that's, that's Admiral, Admiral, Admiral uh, Goggins is, sorry, um, Admiral Pana. He's the uh, Program Executive Office Strategic Submarines, or, or short for his uh, PEO, SSBN. So, Whereas originally, he, Admiral Papano was solely focused on delivering the Columbia. 
and the future strategic platform. Um, that responsibility is, uh, is, is still being stewarded by PMS 397, which is incorporated in his, P, in his PEO now. Um, he has also gained responsibility, which is that the second blue box with the red, red circle around it for uh, all in-service, all in-service strategic assets. And that box is now PMS 396. And uh, so, so, um, so now he's, he'll be in charge of all the current assets and all the new construction assets that are coming on board to support the mission of, of uh, strategic defense. Um, this change was a good fit because the strategic, the strategic platforms has a, they they have a dedicated they have dedicated maintenance facilities and requirements that are unique to these holes. Um, one side one side uh, one, one factoid here is that all the, the this 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 uh, hole or that we have that we use that we use for strategic for the, for the strategic platform they're all two man crews. Or excuse me, they're all they have they have two crews. They have a blue and a gold crew, so they'll they'll trade off. So because of that, they have different specific maintenance requirements, specific operational tempo. Uh, the, the pretty much the whole base is designed for supporting this type of this type of platform. When so fast attacks submarines, they use they use completely different bases for your support. Therefore, these uh, therefore our our SSPN facilities will have to adapt to to uh, incrementally handle both the Columbia, and which is the new submarine coming up online, and the legacy platform, which is the Ohio. And that, and that was the impetus for generating the new, the new code, which was PMS 396. The, uh, the third block, therefore, um, um, and also to, um, let me see, rolling, uh, rolling, rolling the SSGN, which into his, uh, which is the, um, the guided missile submarines into his domain was uh, also a good fit because um, you know, most not everyone's aware, but the first, the uh, SS we have four guided missile submarines, and they they consist of uh, converted Ohio class submarines. So the first four Ohio class submarines, which were Ohio, Michigan, Florida, and Georgia, all became. All became the SSGNs. So the ships had the, the GNs and the BNs have different mission, have different missions, but effectively it's the same hull with the same maintenance requirements, the same quirks. So lastly, for PEO SSPN, there's that there was a new block that was you know, added to uh, the PEO. <laughs> and given that strategic deterrence is the number one priority for the Navy, we needed to ensure that the industrial base will be there to support throughout the lifetime of these platforms. Therefore, this third program office is being stood up to assist and, and ensure the industrial base is there, is there and ready to support through all, all needs in the future. I'd like to move over to, move over one block to the left, same slide. And this is uh, Admiral Goggins. He is the program executive office for tax submarines or P, uh, PEO, SSN. So similar to PEO SSBN, PEO attack subs includes program offices for new construction. So going straight down, you see PMS 450 is the program office focus on delivery and updates to the Virginia class submarine. There, and that's the submarine that's being built right now to replace the, uh, the Los Angeles class. Below that on the chart, is the not is the uh, not a full program yet program office, which is called SSN Next, and obviously even though we're still building Virginia, the the lead time for for designing and 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 getting the uh, the uh, the procurement items for a new new class of, new class of ship is so long that you have to start designing the new one before you're even done building the current one. So they don't, they're not a full program office yet, but they're busy ramping up developments to, uh, to, fall, to, to relieve or to, uh, to, to uh, take the place of Virginia when, she's when it's time for her to sunset. The next block down there is for 
sub 073 and they are the undersea technology office. Sub 073 is basically the R&D group for Team Submarine. They focus on hull, mechanical, electrical, and stealth technologies that are needed and used, for, used by the submarine. Okay. Uh, one of the other, so at the, still in the uh, P and uh, POS SN is PMS 392, and they they are the in-service submarines. Uh, they stored all the in, all the in-service assets from Los Angeles, Seawolf, and Virginia. And the reason they got affected by the reorg was because originally SSGN was under was under PMS 392, but now they've moved where they where I think they make have a better fit, especially with uh, all their, their requirements. Next new office there is PMS 390. And uh, there's is the undersea special mission systems. They certify and maintain uh, undersea rescue capability. And they also integrate operations with, with special operating forces and the certification and upkeep of the submarine tri-deck shelters. Next up, we're going to there is uh, PMS 394 and their advanced undersea systems. Uh, they do a number of rapid R&D efforts and to uh, try out new things on submarines. And they're, they're, they're the lead on, on that type of effort. Uh, next there is, is SubMEP. And SubMEP is the submarine maintenance and planning activity. They track and sustain our maintenance records and plans for, for uh, submarines, the entire submarine force. And you can tell from your chart there that they are also matrix over to, uh, to help the, uh, help the, uh, the SSPN side of uh, in-service in ships. Next over on, on the left is, that's uh, Admiral, Admiral Anderson, and he is the Program Executive Office for Undersea Warfare Systems or PEO UWS. And uh, his, this PEO, this is uh, the, the items in this PEO are, would, would, uh, would also would, uh, would provide coverage for previous two, the attack and the strategic submarines. And they also cover uh, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other items that, aren't specific, that are not specific to those submarines as well. So first off, which is something that's common in all of them is the is PMS 401, which is acoustic systems. They lead the development of sonar systems on all of our platforms. They provide basically they provide the eyes and ears for the submarine while they're submerged. Next up is right across from it is PMS 404, undersea weapons office, undersea, uh, undersea weapons office. They're in charge of developing, certifying, maintaining all the kinetic assets that the submarine carries on board and can employ all, all on their mission. PMS, PMS 425 is the combat and weapons control. They own all of the, so they don't own the things that go boom, but they own all the hardware and the software for the combat system. And also they maintain control over the programming that, go, that allows the different combat systems and sensors to talk with each other. So that way it allows the operator to develop a solution and be able to deliver the, deliver the kinetic effect or what have you to its target. Next up is PMS 415, which is undersea defensive warfare systems. So whereas now you know that, this is also, um, they develop, well, they develop the countermeasures that the ships use, such as the things you see in movies where cans just shoot out of the submarine to make noise and confuse the enemy. Um, again, even though they're defensive systems, they, they still have to, they still communicate with the weapons control system because it's, it's, it's all, that falls as part of the, uh, the programming that, that has to go into the weapons control system. Only a few more of these left. So PMS 435 is the electrical systems. They do all the electromagnetic sensors and masks. Uh, they also they also um, support the optical system, optical sensors that the submarine used on on mission. 
So pretty much anything that anything that the submarine has that sticks out of the water that is used either to communicate or take or interpret signals that that goes through the through PMS four thirty five. So from here now we're moving on to stuff that's not specific that's not doesn't cross into the submarines. Uh, and this is PMS 45. So PMS 45 is Maritime Surveillance Office. So they don't provide stuff that actually goes on a hull, but they lead the effort on undersea sensing systems. And these are both these can be both fixed sensors, fixed, fixed or on the sea floor. Um, they also um, uh, they also incorporate are also control items such as the the surtask uh, sur surtask vessels that, that operate tow systems. And they also are in the forefront of developing deployable expeditionary systems that can be uh, sent to uh, areas of concern around the world. Uh, next group here is the training and readiness group. So teams are I mean, we have training centers and equipment for the operators that, that uh, on, on different, various different bases. And uh, these training equipment have to be maintained and, and sustained. And uh, we have equipment ranging from uh, mock-ups of the individual, individual, fire, individual combat systems that are on each of the hulls and the firefighting equipment and diesel engines. Uh, one, thing, one thing to note with the different combat systems, it's not as simple as just saying, as just having one combat system and that's it, that's all you need on your base. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a squadron of, of six boats, that could be at least, that, that could be, you could have, well, you definitely have more than one combat system on those boats because they all go through different, different iterations. So it's definitely a big task for the, the training and group to maintain up-to-date systems. So that way when the crew goes up to the front, goes up to the trainer, they're actually training on, on their combat system and they don't have to use some other system. Next up is we have a new office, which is Undersea Enterprise, which is the Undersea Enterprise Program Integration Office. It's a new office that's being set up. And this, this is, uh, they have the goal of facilitating uh, new technology in the submarines and being able to provide smooth integration for them. And uh, we have zero, uh, 07Q, they're the submarine safety fly-by-wire and deep submergent system office. They provide quality, quality assurance and oversee the process for maintaining safe operation uh, of our vessels when we go to sea. When you have a submarine that goes to sea and you do maintenance on it, you need to make sure that, that everything you took apart is going back together again. So there's a system of audits that and, uh, and surveillances that go into place. And, uh, and 07Q is responsible for maintaining that across the fleet. And uh, lastly, on the Norwich chart, we have sub, we have a 07L, which is the logistics uh, office. The logistics is a core competency, and even though it's uh, even though it's it's housed here in PO uh, UWS, it it, uh, it covers all the other PEOs, and then uh, they provide support for all of them. So, team submarine then is comprised there of three flag officers. That's why that's why we call ourselves team because it's more than one. And uh, that's for now. Thank you for uh, that. Provides that. That's that's the uh, my update for uh, our organization on how we how we're in business. Uh, we have our topics. Uh, our topics run right now instead of uh, going detail on them. Um, I've got topics on my new constructions, which are bridging in Colombia. Uh, I've, I've got topics supporting the undersea weapons and, and, and uh, counter and the undersea defensive systems, as well as the electromagnetic spectrum guys and the maritime surveillance. So uh, I encourage you to look at the topics. You find something that's find something that's that's in your swim lane that you might, that you might want to propose to. By all means, reach out to the topic authors now and take advantage of the open window. Thank you for your time. All right, great. Thank you. Oh, my camera got reset. Thank you very much, Roberto. Now we will hear from Jennifer Greenwood. Jennifer, give me one second to bring up your presentation here. Thanks, Del. 
Awesome. So good afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Jennifer Greenwood. I am the SBIR STTR Technology Manager for PEO USC. And you can forward to the next slide now. So this is our PEO USC portfolio. Um, it is who we are. It is slightly out of date. Um, things have been a little bit dynamic over the past year and a half in PEO USC. As you can see, we're very diverse. Um, if you're not familiar with our PEO, um, we have unmanned surface vehicles, subsurface vehicles, mine warfare, and last year we added PMS 408, which is expeditionary missions, and PMS 340, which is naval special warfare, um, to our PEO. The addition of these two program offices really brings an additional focus and advances our ability to conduct mine countermeasures, as well as special operations. So up until this last October, we did all things LCS, which included new construction, sustainment and fielding of the mission packages and mission systems. However, a recent shift in on the fleet support and sustainment piece over um, to C21 office at NAVC. So C21 takes care of the sustainment piece for the um, kind of the whole fleet writ large. Um, and we moved PMS 505 over to that piece. So we still do have LCS and a bunch of different um, you know, ship platforms. We have the frigate foreign for military sales, which is specifically the four ships that are on order to the Saudis. And over half of our portfolio is still shipbuilding focus. The other half on the right-ish slide of the slide is our ship systems. And in addition to PMS 340 and 408, you'll see our UMS program office, PMS 406, as well as our MIW program office, PMS 495. So just to pause for a second on UMS, which is our unmanned systems. Um, unmanned is a really critical growth area for us. And the PEO is intersecting just about every program and uh, PMS 406 is intersecting just about every program office in our PEO because they are tiny ships. So they're going to have that sustainment piece and they're going to have a lot of those, those larger ship uh, issues in an unmanned uh, vessel. So that's MLUSV, M and LUSV, X and L, UUVs and MUUV, those are all within PMS 406. And then in PMS uh, 420, we have the MCM USV, Mine Countermeasures USV is what that's called, um, the Mine Hunting Unit and Knife Fish. Um, 408 also has unmanned systems with the Mark 18 Mod 2 and the MEM UUV and Lionfish. And 340 also uses the Mark 18 Mod 1. So we do have those unmanned systems kind of dissecting our whole portfolio across the board. So um, things that are happening in PO, PMS 406 are also going to be happening in other program offices. And you'll see that in our topic. So if PMS 406 writes a topic for some unmanned system, it is a pretty good bet that the other program offices are also going to be interested in those uh, unmanned systems. Um, and many of our SBIR interest areas and advertised advertised topics are going to end up in these same, same issues, cross-cutting those multiple programs. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just going to go ahead and get right into our topics. Um, so I, I kind of picked one off of each slide um, so I can kind of keep the time down. Um, so the first topic I'm going to talk about is N221028, which is unmanned harbor piloting. Um, so PMS 406 is really interested in developing an, an an autonomous harbor pilot system. If you're familiar with how harbor pilots work in the commercial industry, um, it's a very challenging endeavor. Um, I think kind of the big news story right now is off the coast of, of LA and the harbor. Um, we have a lack of harbor pilots, so their harbor pilots have to be brought out from the port, put on, brought on board a ship, and they navigate that ship safely into the harbor. So as we go through the process of developing unmanned systems, we are learning kind of things we never thought of that are necessary. And one of those is going to be unmanned harbor piloting. So we're looking for this capability that's going to allow a USV. For right now, USVs, this may progress to UUVs that have surfaced. But right now, we're just looking at the USV side um, that's going to transit a harbor channel or straight without any human intervention, while also adhering to the navigational rules. And the big navigational rules that we follow are the US Coast Guard navigational rules and regulations. Those are called the coal regs, you'll hear them referred to. Um, 
But this topic is going to include recognizing harbor habits, ha harbor hazards, such as bridges, marine traffic, buoys, plan and planning a recommended route for the ship to follow. So it should also include some traffic schemes. We want to include some restricted areas, congested, confined, cluttered, and unimproved harbors as well. So it's kind of a very wide uh, swath of things to consider when we're looking at this topic. Next slide, please. So I am going to pick the bottom one on this one. So it's N221033, Perception System for Situational Awareness and Contact Detection for Unmanned Underwater Vehicles. So our UUV fleet needs to surface periodically, sometimes to get GPS fixes, charge batteries, or communicate with other vessels. Um, but right now, we currently don't have a method for identifying potential surface or near surface contacts, obstacles, features, and determining if the environment in general is safe for the UUV to surface. So um, we have lost UUVs that we've been you know, operating in the harbor. They have surfaced into a larger vessel and we've lost that vehicle. So um, it's very important that we have some safe navigation, some situational awareness for those UUVs to surface. So we're looking for developing and demonstrating the autonomous perception system to facilitate that safe service service and navigate uh, operations for UUVs um, while we're maneuvering either underwater or on the surface or both. Um, we're really hoping with this topic to reduce the risk of collision and equipment damage and even theft from adversaries um, and really just keep the, the mission successful. This will likely go classified in the phase two. So if you're proposing on this, you wanna make sure that you have a mechanism of uh, processing classified material. All right, next slide. I am going to talk to the STTR on the bottom, which is N22A T012. So this is a survivable mission, minefield mission data module. And I'm gonna kind of, when we talk about this, we compare this to the aircraft black box. We're looking for a hardened black box kind of um, capability. Um, that's kind of the biggest comparison that I can make, but we're looking for this to withstand blast effects and preserve mission data from UUVs uh, and our remotely operated vehicle systems. Um, mines and IEDs can be detonated underwater by acoustic and magnetic noise from passing vessels in the vicinity and other UUVs and ROVs that are con conducting mine clearance operations. We don't deploy our mine uh, hunting vehicles, the UUVs and the ROV platforms to be expendable. We generally like to get those back and retrieve them, but they're susceptible and they're not hardened against any detonation of a mine. Um, while they're performing operations. So an inadvertent de detonation can resu result in a loss of all of the da data that they've collected on that mission. So the program office is kind of interested in two potential um, capabilities for this. One is a retrievable data module that's just you know, going to be able to store. They'd like it to be encrypted in case it can't be, so it can't be um, retrieved by enemies and have all of our data. Um, so some way to locate and retrieve the black box. The other is uh, a method of, you know, retrieving just the data. So having some sort of connection, uh, secure connection that you can go and retrieve the data off of the black box without actually physically getting the box. We'd also like, you know, a though obviously a scuttle capability so that we can erase that um, that module once we retrieve the data so that the the data isn't sitting out there on the the ocean floor waiting for someone to come and get it. Next slide, please. So these are some resources that we have. Um, SBA has a lot of really great local partners that are here to train and support any potential SIBR applicants. So if you're really interested in SIBR um, and you can go to that link, you can also do a Google search. If you're in New Mexico, you can do the New Mexico SIBR assistant or uh, New Mexico civil resource civil resources. I'm sure you can contact Dell as well, but just putting that out there, kind of Google your state and SBIR resources, and you'll get a whole list of, of various things to help you kind of with your proposal. Um, CyberDefenseBusiness.org is a good one as well, as well as the DOD Cyber Innovation Portal. That's a great site, DSIP. And NavyCyber.com has a lot of Navy specific information that will be very helpful for you developing your proposal. And that is all I have. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. And Doug, you are up. Let me bring up your slides right now. So you are ready to go, Doug. 
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, right, thank you very much, Dale, for the platform here. As you can see here, we are the Program Executive Office Integrated Warfare Systems. And if you look at the center there, you can see uh, in the iris, so to speak, uh, you see a lot of IWS 4, 5, uh, 8. The numbers are not sequential. I think part, in part because I couldn't fit all of the uh, little icons and stuff like that in certain sections, but there is a method here. If you look at the items that go across the bottom, those are uh, basically elements. And what is an element? An element is a, uh, a system such as a, a radar or a missile or a sonar that is acquired by these individuals and it goes into the combat systems which are up above. For example, some of you are aware of in that about 11 o'clock up there in the diagram, you'll see IWS-1, which is the Aegis combat system. And if you go over to about three o'clock, you'll see IWS-10, which is the, self, and is the ship self-defense system. So those two are very similar in, in, in nature. So that gives you kind of a feel for how we are organized. <clears throat> now, we were stood up back in uh, FY 2002. Uh, and the gist of the thing was they wanted to pull all of the combat systems and their associated elements uh, into one PEO. If you look at the uh, various elements here, you can see that we actually, in many cases, turn ships into combatants. So we are the acquisition authority for these elements and the combat systems. Uh, <clears throat> now, a little bit about each one of them. Uh, I'm not gonna go through every one of them. The ones that are of interest for you folks who are listening today are IWS 2, 3, 5, 6, and 10. The other uh, major program managers did not uh, want to uh, participate in this particular cycle that uh, we're presenting here today. So I'm going to just describe very briefly what, uh, let's start with IWS-2. IWS-2 is the acquisition authority for all of the surface Navy radars and also their EW systems, uh, including decoys. It is within this organization that the high energy laser is placed. You can see Helios there if you look to the right or they're very far to the right. So that gives you a feel for what they're interested in. We have several topics that they uh, have included in this particular BAA. If you go to IWS-3, this is the location where the guns, the projectiles, the hypervelocity round, the uh, rail guns, some of you are familiar with that. This is where it is. Uh, it's having some funding problems currently, but that's where that is. The Saturn missile uh, is a big part of their work in the vertical launch system. If you go on to IWS-5, IWS-5, when IWS was stood up, uh, this group that was doing a lot of their technology over their subs was moved into IWS. And anti-submarine warfare is here. The... Um, Sonar and total rays, radome, uh, not radome, so sonar domes and windows, they all reside within this organization here, the CVTSC is, uh, that goes under carriers. Let's see, I talked about those. And if we go over to IWS, let's see, six. IWS six, some of you are familiar with the uh, CEC, if you see right there at nine o'clock, the cooperative engagement capability. Uh, this system, in essence, uh, takes data from sensors on other ships, in fact, all the ships within the battle group, certain, certain selected ones. They take that information, they transmit it to each other, and everyone comes up with the same composite track. If you have something, say, non-cooperative target, some of the ships can see that target and some can't. This makes a composite uh, track that is of fire control solution quality, which means that uh, a signal can, can be given to a specific ship which has the highest probability of launching a missile which would uh, counter the threat. If you go over to IWS-10, IWS-10 is the uh, ship self-defense. Uh, they 
that are on the carrier's net, and they have a limited number of uh, capabilities there. And in fact, they have one of the uh, topics that are in here or there. Now, I failed to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Douglas Marker. I am the technology manager, and uh, the IAR program or the SBR program is my principal responsibility. We have on the order of uh, it varies depending on whether we're in the phase ones, which we have two to three topics per or uh, contractors per topic, and then we neck it down to one. Our topics are selected through the process of going to the uh, we have in our organization a group which is called the uh, SMT IPT. A representative from all of these MPMs are invited to this. What happens is at a certain time of the year when the call comes out for topics, for example, right now we're in the process of developing topics for FY23. We ask them to come in, prioritize as to the topics they want to go forward with. So within IWS, we have, I guess you could say, a competition as to which topics are going forward. And in general, the topics that are ranked number one through three for those who submit are approved. This year, or for this BAA, we have 19 total. Some of those are SBIRs and some are STTR. Most of them are, I think, I forget the exact ratio, but I think there's something like uh, 16 SBR or uh, yeah, SBR and the others are STTR. Now, like I said, two, three, five, and six and 10 ones uh, I didn't pick up the time I've got here, Dale. So if I start getting close to 12 minutes, holler and I'll, I'll slow down. If you could move to slide three, I think it is. Right, this is 041. This is an IWS2. It's the only one that I'll be presenting within IWS1. Uh, <clears throat> Notice it says compact, high power, mid wave, infrared, millimeter wave laser system. The challenge here is the following we have a situation where the effective shipboard infrared countermeasure re countermeasures require compact laser sources that are capable of covering entire infrared bands in a single high quality output beam. Now, what does this mean? The mid wave band is prob prob problematic because it is effectively divided into two distinct sub bands. And we don't have uh, available uh, laser sources that can cover both subbands of the millimeter wave IR with suitable output beam quality and sufficient output power are simply not available. This not only increases system costs, but it inhibits system development in the first place. So we're looking for someone, a company, that can demonstrate a compact laser source that provides multiple output spectral lines across the usable millimeter wave spectrum including both sub bands. And we anticipate that this would be basically a module and it must produce a single high quality output beam having a scalable architecture and demonstrate a path towards affordable manufacturing. I'm now gonna go over to uh, IWS3. In IWS3, if you go to page, uh, let's see, I think it's seven. Maybe I'll Yeah, great. Uh, I'm going to focus on the one at the bottom here. Uh, <clears throat> I've been working with IWS since it was stood up. And uh, IWS3 comes in periodically and they say we need better radomes and we need better uh, uh, fins and control surfaces and this kind of stuff. And the reason is the threat keeps getting more uh, difficult to counter. So uh, they, they've come in again and they're saying, hey, we, we need uh, some special materials for the radomes. Uh, and this is some of the problems that they're running into. Missile radomes are not only subjected to the higher temper temperatures and stresses, but also environmental conditions. And these are some of the conditions that they run into. They run into rain, sleet, sand, and even dust can degrade the performance of the radome. Therefore, we're looking for a company that can develop radome technology. It could be materials, it could be architecture to improve radome performance addressing the anticipated missile flight and environmental conditions. Ideally, a common radome solution could be used across multiple missile systems. Now, if you just flip very quickly to the next geograph, Dale. Yeah. yeah. 
It's, it's, it's the same situation. And here, I only bring it up. I'm not going to go into the details here, but it's the same situation, except here we're concerned about having materials that will uh, support going high speeds and having phenomenal maneuverability. Uh, for in, with the, so we're looking for materials that can, can uh, go on fins and on uh, uh, control surfaces. Let's go to um, AWS. Actually, it's AWS 5, I believe. UF 12. The reason I brought this one up is this shows how we are working sometimes with off the Office of Naval Research. We have these sonar domes and there's a, a problem of anti-fouling which uh, impacts the performance. ONR has developed a new technology for measuring anti-fouling on sonar domes. Problem is we have no framework and algorithms for predicting the degradation of anti-fouling on sonar domes. So we're looking for someone we can develop a framework for capturing this newly available measurement on anti-fouling and create predictive forecasting for anticipated life of in-service sonar domes. From there, let's go over to uh, IWS6. I have one there that I'd like to highlight. Uh, this one is, uh, I believe, slide 14. <clears throat> okay, we need to uh, for the, uh, this is in the CEC and they, they need to be able to have very um, accurate positioning of their platforms if they're going to support the composite tracks that I told you about uh, at a level that it, it would be a, a fire control solution. Uh, they rely heavily upon the GPS system. They're looking for something that would be other, a secondary source. So the title here is Velocity Over Ground Sensor for Initial Navigation Systems. Now, we're, when I think of over ground, the first time I saw this, I thought well, over land, and that's not it. They're talking about the, the bottom of the ocean is what they're looking at. So the inertial navigation system can accurately predict position when using GPS as an external source. But the problem is periodically they need external position fi uh, fixes to accurately predict position when we don't have GPS. So we need an alternative. So we're looking for a company that can develop a velocity over ground sensor as an alternate INS external source for producing a good fix. So let's go now to uh, this slide is slide number 17. I believe. The kill assessment closely spaced objects. Uh, <clears throat> We have a situation where the current SSDS, remember I said this is, goes to board carriers and big decks, consists of rely heavily on onboard radar systems and processing for tracking, classification, and discrimination of incoming threats. Uh, depending on the trajectories and spacing of the inbound threats, it can be difficult for those radar systems to achieve an accurate count of the number of threats present. This is particularly a problem if uh, we have a a raid of multiple targets. And if some of them are too close together, what happens is without an accurate count of inbound threats, the SSES combat system must make choices on how to respond, which may be less than optimal and may not achieve the rate annihilation. And so this is what we're looking for, a method to improve the confidence metric for kill assessment to the use of electro-optical infrared imaging uh, to resolve close space objects and observe hard kill intercepts. And accurate uh, intercept points will all allow the, uh, let's see, the capability to observe intercept points will allow the combat system to provide improved subsequent responses. So uh, that's very brief. It's very top level. Uh, I think it has been mentioned before that uh, we highly recommend that you contact uh, the authors of the topics and get your specific questions answered. Uh, we wish you well in uh, your pursuit. Over to you, Dale. Great. Thank you very much, Doug. And I know you were worried about time. You finished one minute early. Good. All right. So finally, we're going to have Sean Slade present. Sean, I am bringing up your slides right now. Okay, great. 
Okay, well, just do a brief introduction here. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Sean Slade. I'm the Assistant Program Executive Officer for Air ASW Assault, Assault and Special Mission Aircraft at the Naval Air Systems Command Headquarters, uh, Pax River, Maryland. So uh, you've heard uh, a bunch from the topics of uh, from NAVC uh, Systems Command. So um, I'm the lone NAV Air representative this afternoon. So take it easy on me. Anyhow, I'm a former uh, Navy H-60 pilot who used to conduct uh, air ASW uh, warfare. So getting innovative solutions out to the fleet is one of my most uh, important missions. And uh, I'm a Navy grad, so I need to say way to go Navy with the big win over Army last week. And uh, so anyhow, so I'll get, I'll get going with the presentation. Um, go to the next slide. Um, you see NAVAIR's role in naval aviation, of course, uh, similar to Naval Sea Systems Command, would provide uh, full life cycle support, uh, but for us, naval aviation aircraft weapons and systems. Uh, we also do the analysis and decision support for costs, schedule and performance trades and investment decisions. Obviously, with everything uh, now with the DOD top line being level, uh, we are definitely looking at cost effective solutions. So keep that in mind when you're bringing one of your technologies to bear that they have to replace uh, or be more cost effective than existing uh, technologies out there. Um, so make sure that that's part of your, uh, your package. Next. So now their products, I mentioned uh, there's fixed wing. We also have uh, on the fixed wing front, that's an F-18, uh, but we also have in my portfolio, the PA program office as well as several others. You see the H-53 there, Rotocraft, and then uh, Unmanned Air Systems, that's on the PEO UNW side, uh, as well as the weapons, and then the uh, Common Aviation Systems, that's in PEO uh, Common Systems. Next slide. Here's my portfolio. Um, PEOA, uh, the current PEOA is Major General Greg Mazziello. Um, and then he has these uh, 10 different program offices. So I'll run through them and uh, some of the different technologies that they're looking for kind of at a top level. And then I'll hit a couple of our topics. Um, but anyhow, so PMA 261 Marine Corps heavy lift helicopters uh, like the H5, uh, MH and CH-53 and the new CH-53 Kilo. Uh, they're looking for composite repair uh, technologies and uh, some corrosion mitigation technology as well to maintain the, uh, the existing fleet of H-53 helicopters. Uh, PMA-264 there, you see Area SW Systems. Uh, their main product being Sona buoys. Of course, uh, it's a five inch by three foot long uh, container. So they're always looking uh, for miniaturization of Sona buoy components and advanced uh, transducer materials. PMA-275, they're the uh, B-22 Osprey uh, program office. They not only have Marine Corps uh, B-22s, but Air Force and then the Navy, the new Navy CMB-22. Uh, they're looking for corrosion mitigation technologies and uh, advanced coating removal technologies, uh, as well as several others, but that's one of their primary. Um, PMA-276, that's the Marine Corps Light Attack, uh, Light uh, and Assault Attack Helicopter Program Office as well as the uh, new program that's coming online is the Future Vertical Lift Aura, so attack utility replacement aircraft, uh, obviously for the UH and AH-1. And uh, that, that program is uh, just kicking off. Um, uh, the acquisition decision memorandum is uh, being signed um, as we speak. So they're looking for advanced technologies and sensors uh, and airframes for, for that future capability. Uh, PMA 299, that's the multi-mission helicopter or H-60 program office, so H-60R and S, as well as the uh, future vertical lift maritime strike program office, which is going to be the H-60 replacement. And similar to the uh, PMA 276, although a, a completely different mission set, they're looking for advanced technologies and uh, sensors, uh, for sensors and airframe uh, for that capability. So, sorry. Um, PMA 290, um, that's our Maritime Patrol and Reconnaissance aircraft, uh, principally the P8, now since the P3s 
uh, being retired, but we still have uh, the EP3 aircraft in that portfolio. So uh, obviously they're dealing with very large data sets. So artificial intelligence and machine learning is very key to their program, as well as all the supportability and readiness topics um, that, you, that you see. PMA 271, that's our Airborne Strategic Command and Control Communications uh, platform, legacy E6B, and then uh, the future platform EXX um, is, is uh, just in the beginning as we speak. So uh, some, of the, some of the writing next topics could apply to them as well. Integrated health and monitoring, uh, the, those kinds of technologies could be helpful to that platform. PMA 207, uh, that's our commercial transport and support aircraft, including the C-130 and C-9. And uh, as I mentioned, and with for the, uh, the E-6, uh, integrated health and monitoring systems, as well as all the different readiness uh, solutions for um, corrosion and, uh, and maintenance uh, could be helpful there as well. And then PMA 274 uh, usually doesn't play too heavily in the SBIR topics. Uh, since they are very mature technologies, obviously very low risk or very little as in no risk for presidential uh, transport. So, um, but that is in our portfolio as well. So uh, Myriad, Plethora, lots of different uh, platforms, lots of different programs. And uh, we still try to look across the board for common readiness solutions, uh, as well as any kind of uh, sensors, uh, similar to all the NAVC uh, folks that you heard from today, we look for that commonality across programs uh, to make at ma maximum benefit of the SBIR program. Uh, to note, I don't think it's been mentioned so far, but each program also has a, um, by law, has a small business advocate, which is the deputy program manager, as well as advanced development and science technology uh, leads. So um, for all the topics um, that you'll hear today or that I'll touch on or all topics in general, um, they are endorsed by one or more uh, PMAs. So um, reaching out to uh, not only myself, but the program office leads um, for topic solutions and potential topics is, is really key to this whole program. And uh, that information can be made uh, available, that contact information can be made available through the summit hosts or, or reaching out directly. Um, so I guess I'll go uh, to some of the next slides and we'll just hit a couple of the topics. We'll have to jump around. So room temperature filler for honeycomb repairs. This is a uh, topic applicable to multiple PMAs, uh, multiple NAVAIR programs, not only in the PEOA portfolio, but across the board. So, um, Current composite honeycomb repairs rely on either epoxy fill or high temperature cure syntactic foams or a seven day room temperature cure of syntactic foams. These obviously have drawbacks, including long times to complete the repair, additional required equipment, and increased uh, resultant uh, weight for the epoxy fills. So, this, um, this topic uh, seeks to provide a new lightweight streamlined, streamlined composite honeycomb repair material and process using a novel formulation to reduce the time required for those repairs. The uh, proposed material can take advantage of various matrix chemistries and fillers. So uh, definitely one on, on the readiness front for us. So we're, I'm going to skip ahead a couple topics uh, down to topic N2020, N221023. Del, if you're running the slide deck. Yeah, so this one uh, is one that's near and dear to my heart, um, uh, being an ASW guy. And this is uh, developing in innovative miniaturized data tether modules for uh, sonar buoys and ASW. So deep and long life sonar buoys have unique size and capacity constraints due to the additional tether length and the uh, large uh, power supplies to get that uh, duration. And we're talking potentially multiple weeks of duration. So to try to put all that into a five inch and uh, three foot container uh, is very problematic. Um, so following air launch and water entry, the data, data tether deploys the payload, payload to a program depth and then suspends the payload for the duration of the operation. So this topic addressed the need for new data tether modules to provide a strength and full depth, communi 
full duplex communications data link between the center buoy's surface unit and the suspended payload that may be upwards of multiple miles uh, down in, in the ocean. So you can imagine the, the, the size uh, that you're dealing with here uh, as far as the, the spool of wire or, or cable that's trying to, to do this. Um, if you want, go to the next topic. The next, I believe it's uh, the direct to, yeah, direct to phase two. So I mentioned with the PA program, uh, dealing with a lot of data sources. So uh, trying to use our artificial intelligence to uh, do automated detection, classification, characterization of all that data. So I'll read just a little bit of the, the text here. Non-traditional adaptive human level and human style artificial intelligence uh, signal processing algorithms have the potential to increase detection range in high littoral noise environments while extracting precise target signatures that optimize detection tracking and classification. The consistently no novel, noisy, and nonlinear aspects of magnetics, EOIR, and acoustics data critical for, for Navy detection, DC, uh, DCL, uh, present particularly difficult problems for the standard techniques of machine learning, especially deep learning. To be functional, artificial neural networks of the latter must be trained on large curated data of the signal in order to filter out noise. Um, so this topic is essentially going after uh, human intelligence, uh, the level of human intelligence and actual artificial intelligence uh, to deal with that very difficult uh, data set. We'll go to, I think I've got one more, and it's actually a readiness topic for the V22 program. If you go down to N22A T003, yeah. So uh, novel multi-physics modeling of electroplating process for metallic aerospace components. So um, naval aircraft opportune, operate routinely in very severe saltwater environments, and that corrosion is a leading cause of, uh, of our readiness uh, issues out in the fleet. We spend over $3 billion in the Navy uh, fighting corrosion maintenance and, the, and having the subsequent, or fighting corrosion and uh, the supporting maintenance and repairs for this. Um, so uh, one of the things that has been brought to bear is electro deposition of cadmium uh, on high strength steel components uh, to protect against that corrosion. However, that cadmium uh, creates environmental hazards and some occupational uh, safety and health risks. Um, there's been some um, a new coating, zinc uh, nickel, that has been applied and it has, a, a, has been a suitable replacement for the cadmium plating. But we need to be able to characterize its strength um, uh, very well and certify it as far as the qualification process on uh, high strength steel components. So that's what we're looking at uh, for uh, software tools to be able to do that um, uh, as part of the optimization and qualification process. So that one's for our PMA 275 for our V22 uh, tilt rotor uh, program office and it applies to uh, readiness. So um, I think that's it. I don't think I have any more on there. Uh, I think we're probably up against our time anyhow. But anyhow, thanks for your time today and look forward to uh, responding uh, to uh, or taking a look at the responses to this broad area announcement. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Sean. So we do have a couple of more minutes um, left in our panel, and I'd like to throw kind of a curveball at our uh, TPOCs here um, and ask a question. You know, throughout pretty much all of y'all's presentations, you talked about reaching out you know, finding out more, talking to the TPOX, you know, talking to those uh, uh, contact managers, and even in some of our panel sessions earlier, particularly our tales from the frontline SBIR, STTR awardees, they talked about how it was so great, how it was a great business practice, how it really set them up when they contacted those TPOX, when they had those discussions. But from y'all's side, your standpoint, you know, people can find the TPOX and DSIP, they'll find the topic, they even get a link to click on to send an email, but they send you an email, 
now what? What should they actually be talking to you all about when they do that outreach? What, what should they be finding out? What kind of things should they be asking you? What are those things that you think are so critical to cover in those conversations they might have with you? I can make some comments. Can you hear me? Uh, yep, we can hear you just fine, Doug. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> you should not be asking questions on how to write your proposal and stuff. The VA has a description of what you need to do, the font sizes, the number of pages and stuff. At least that's, that's my, my take on it. You need to ask questions which are technically oriented, I think. Uh, I, th I think that uh, a lot of people want to uh, get answers to certain questions. And it's very difficult to catch some of these uh, people because, I, for example, today I was in an interview, uh, one on one, and the individual asked uh, about contacting the uh, authors, uh, and I knew them. I says, uh, "Don't go after the author in this one because he's on travel all the time, and you won't be able to get hold of him." What I'm saying is, if you can't get hold of one, try the other, and if they've got an email address, try and send, send that to them. But uh, they can answer technical questions. You got to realize that they can't uh, answer some questions maybe in the detail you want because of uh, classification. Phase ones are not classified and they can't talk to you over the phone anyway on something that's unclassified, but they can give you some, uh, a little bit of scope, I think, on what you're, what you're uh, expecting. And they can address, I think, a little more um, specificity as to uh, what they're looking for. Back to you, Dale. Great, thank you, Doug. Um, would any of our other panelists like to talk about their idea with how people should approach them, what they should cover in those initial conversations? If not, I'm gonna fire another question off at y'all. I can, I can kind of take that. Um, so I always tell my topic authors that the whole point of the conversation is to clarify the ideas in the topic and provide additional context of the topic. Um, we're not allowed to suggest or recommend or even validate technical approaches that are brought to us. Um, we can just kind of nod and say, that sounds great. Um, but we're there to provide context, give a little bit of history, a little bit of more data that's not in the topic. Those topics are short for kind of for a reason, um, but we want the companies to come up with the innovation. So we wanna make sure that we have you know, given you all of the necessary information to come up with that innovation. And I think it's really important that we don't put a lot of information in the topic so that you can kind of spark that innovation. Um, so it's for context. I also tell folks, you know, um, these are not business development meetings. So if you have, you know, 10 PowerPoints about, you know, what your company can provide, maybe hit that with like a, a really quick elevator speech, but um, folks are trying to get through all of these company meetings and some of them get really bogged down, you know, the week before Christmas and a couple of weeks after Christmas, you wanna make sure you're kind of, you know, really succinct and to the point and you have like a list of questions that you're driving at. Um, so th that's kind of my advice is, is really just look for the context, look, look for those different, um, the history, the background, what we're trying to do in the larger picture, because sometimes the topic leaves that out. I think you kind of gave some really great points there, Jennifer, because one of the things that we always like to tell people is think of these almost like a customer discovery. You're asking questions, you're finding out information, you're finding out the environment, you're finding out the constraints, you're trying to figure out what is that value you can bring to that TPOC, to that PEO, to the defense customer. Would you say that's probably a pretty good estimation of how people should treat these meetings? Definitely, I think that that's, that's really good. And, and also, you know, when you're looking at those, those different conversations, kind of know where you're at and, and kind of ask the deeper question of a lot of our topics have size, weight, and power constraints. Um, figure out where the trade space is in there um, so that you can kind of, if, if you can't make it, you know, if, if it, you can't make it 
that powerful, what else can you do to, you know, kind of give that trade space in there? There may not be any, but if there is some, you may kind of, um, you know, give yourself a little bit more room for, for some innovation. Great, thank you very much. And can I add something? Uh, sure, go ahead, Doug. I think that some contractors feel like they're trying to sell something. <laughs> And that's not the purpose of these uh, interviews. You're not supposed to be trying to sell something. You just, you're trying to get information. I, I think Jim gave just a real perfect description of what you need to do, but uh, you waste your time if, if you start marketing and saying, hey, we can do this and this and this. You want to tell, you want to ask questions as to what we need. Well, Great, thank you very much, Doug. So for anybody that is, wanting to hold one of those one-on-one -on -one sessions, wanting to contact those TPOCs out of the DSIP, looking at those topic areas, keep that in mind. These really aren't a sales pitch. You're finding out more. You're finding out what their constraints are. Why are they constraints? What are the logistics that need to be taken care of? How, what is the environment like that they're going to use these solutions? And what are the things you didn't think of because those can be great big holes in your proposal when you submit it. I'd like to thank all of our um, Navy personnel that you know went through their topics today, gave you an overview of how their offices work, how you integrate solutions, what they look for. We're gonna go ahead and uh, close out this um, session and please join us in our next session, which is starting right now. And we're gonna give you some closing remarks. Mm -hmm.